that way. This meeting is being recorded. Um, I assume you guys have Docker installed already, right? Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll go through like a bit of using Docker later. Uh, why, why you should use Docker is because um, let's say when you're developing, right, then your one project is using a certain version of, of Node.js and another version is using another specific version of Node.js and, and other requirements, not just Node.js, then you might need to, to have an environment where you can deploy everything without needing to install specific versions of applications on your own host machine. Uh, it also helps you quickly develop a development environment. So for example, you you need to have a database or a ready server running and instead of installing it on your computer, you can just uh, run it on a Docker container and link up all your other processes to it. Uh, and it also helps you easily convert your development environment to a staging or production environment. So most of the time de deployment is done using Docker and it's very good if you can make sure that your application can run properly within Docker and you just need to convert the configuration, which is some specific uh, keys and environment variables so that you, you can get it working on production. So this is very similar to virtualization. And uh, in fact, on, on Windows, because there is no Linux kernel, the uh, I think the Docker runs a WSL machine, which is virtualization on to, to launch Docker containers. So the difference between containers and virtual machines is that uh, containers use the underlying kernel to run. So if you're already on a Linux host, you can just use the kernel that you, that you have on your host. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the similar uh, code or similar files in the different containers can be shared instead of needing to have separate uh, duplicates of each in a virtual machine. So for example, if you look at this image, uh, these are virtual machines, which are basically just a, a full machines that are running on your own machine. And you need to have a whole copy of the guest operating system, for example, some kind of Linux. Then you have your uh, libraries and binaries. Then you can have your app running on it. So if if you have multiple virtual machines with a lot of similar stuff, right? Let's say your operating system is all the same and uh, you have different applications using the same libraries. If, if you run it within Docker, you can have a lot of it uh, duplicated, uh, deduplicated. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, for example here, the within your host OS, you have a Docker engine instead of the virtual machine hypervisor. And then you can just have your uh, yeah, libraries and and things that, that only you only need one copy of on your file system. So we can try a simple hello world command. So if you if you run this command here, let me let me run it as well. So when you run it, you'll try to fetch the Ubuntu image. And after downloading it, you can see the output here, hello world, which is what we told this container to do. So we can break this down further. What this command does is it tells Docker, the Docker daemon. So this Docker command is an interface to talk to the Docker daemon. It says, hey, Docker daemon, can you please start a container and remove it after you're done? And we want to use the image Ubuntu. So the image is just a template that we, we can base off and uh, there are a lot of existing images that you can use or you can create your own. 
and then afterwards is is the command that we want the image to run. So in this case, it's just echo hello world, which uh, if you run it on, on your terminal, it does hello world. So that's what it's doing inside this container. So the Docker daemon will look for a local image called Ubuntu. So say if I run it again, it doesn't need to download the image anymore because there's one locally on my machine. You see there's an Ubuntu here. Otherwise, it will look in the default registry, which is uh, Docker Hub, and, and try to pull it. So the first time you run a command, this is what will happen. It will try to download and pull the image. Then you'll start the command using the specific, start the container using the specific command. And because we, we ask it to remove the container, it will remove it. So let's say you do a, Docker. Uh, so, so if we run it without the remove, you notice that we have this container that, that is still still exists, which is no longer running. And you can you can just remove it yourself. If you notice the, the image is the container is gone. So on subsequent runs, your Docker daemon will just use the existing image. So as I mentioned earlier, the Docker image is an immutable template for your containers. So your containers will start based off this, this image template, but anything else that changes after that. Uh, will be overlaid on the file system. So you can pull and push this onto a registry. So it, you can think of it like a, a kind of package or uh, like some way for you to publish this, this uh, built object. And there's a fixed naming convention. So your registry, which is omitted if you're using the Docker Hub registry, uh, then your namespace, which is your username or Docker Hub or something else on other registries. The image name, which is the only compulsory run, and the tag, which defaults to latest. So if you back up, you see we, we pull Ubuntu latest. This is the latest tag that it defaults to. And this is pulling from Docker Hub then these images are identified using an image digest. So this, this is the digest for, for your image. And your container, which is what is running after you, you tell it to run. So this registry defaults to Docker, Docker Hub, which is uh, docker.io. And we can go to hub.docker and we can look for images here. So for example, we, we just put Ubuntu, right? This is the Ubuntu image. And you can either pull like a docker.io slash slash Ubuntu. We need to put I'm not sure how the, the actual Docker Hub registry works, but this is the image that we are pulling, the Ubuntu image from Docker Hub. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the Docker container is just an instance of an image and you can have multiple instances of this image. They're all just based from this whole same image. So you only have one image that's stored on your file system. Then you can have multiple containers that based off it and maintain their own changes. So let's say I run a few other of these containers and see we have uh, three 
three containers all based off this same image. So you can, so if, if this container, uh, let's say we do a Docker run Postgres. You see, we have a Postgres container that is running, and this is still running. We can do a Docker stop Postgres. Uh, so we didn't give it a name, so we have to use this container ID. And normally, you can just type the first four or five uh, letters, and if it's unique, you will be able to know which container to work with. So you see, the Postgres container is not running. Then if we want, we can start it again. And this will persist every change that is done within a container. So these are the other commands that we can use. Uh, so so we have Docker PS, just list all the containers. Docker PS dash A, which also list containers that have exited. Then uh, Docker run, which is what we did earlier, but you can also specify the name for the container. So let's say for example, we uh, we do this same command. Uh, we say we want to specify this to be called Postgres. And Uh, you see, so this container ID is 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 like this, but there is also a name. Uh, if we expand this out, this is the name for the container, and we can just do Docker stop Postgres. And you will target this specific container. Yeah, like this. You pull an image, Docker pull, let's say, node. So you pull from uh, this. So when you run Docker, Docker run, it will automatically pull the image if it's not available. But let's say you want to have the image ready, you can just pull it yourself. Uh, Docker exec, which lets you uh, interact with the container. So if we run a uh, so we run this container. Uh, the dash d just means you run it in the background. So we detach it and we don't attach to the output of it. Then we can do a Docker exec. Uh, we didn't we didn't give this a name, so let me try this again. We give it a name Postgres. So you see, we have an error, right? This container name Postgres already exists. So this is because like uh, Docker needs to store the information about the container. So, for example, the changes in the file system that you have made, and uh, it's not going to to let you create one with the same name. So we remove that container, we create a new one. Then we can try exacting into it. So the container name is Postgres. Then let's say we do uh, going like this and uh, yeah. so the default username is Postgres. Then we can, yeah, just like uh, interact with the database like this. So we can stop the container, remove the container. Yeah. We can watch the logs of the container. Let's say we choose one of these. 
uh, this is the Postgres logs, and we can do a dash F to follow it. it means any new log will appear in your own terminal as well. So these are all commands that you can use to interact with Docker and uh, your containers that are running on it. So like I showed you earlier, we can, uh, by, by default, your container will attach to standard out. So uh, yeah, if you run this, you might have to add uh, this Postgres password. environment variable. So this dash E means you want to set an environment for this container. Uh, set this variable inside the container. And because the Postgres container no longer runs without a specified password, uh, you have to do that. And you see all this standard output, right? It's all attached to your terminal. And uh, in order to to close the terminal, close the container, you, you just like uh, send a control C to try to terminate it. Or, or like I showed you earlier, we can add a dash D, which lets it run in detached mode. So all this output will no longer be in your terminal, but you can still view it with Docker logs, like I showed you earlier. So this output after you run the command is the container ID. So you don't have to do a Docker PS to, to take a look at it. So you do a Docker logs, you see, this is the same stuff that would have been output in your terminal if you didn't do a dash D. So now I have a lot of containers that I no longer want running. I can remove them one by one or just do a Docker prune or Docker so this will remove all stock containers, including containers that you you might still want to continue running next time. But I don't have any of those, so I can just prune all the stock containers. Uh, then I still have three Postgres running, so I can just stop them myself. So these are the names of the containers that you can use uh, as an alternative to the container ID. Some of them. You can also run uh, interactively. So dash i attaches your standard input. And yeah, so you can just type like a Yeah, so you have to press a control D to, to tell it that this is all you're gonna run before you send the output. Uh, so if, if you also want a TTY, so you can actually interact it like how interact with it like how you would a uh, normal in a normal terminal. You add a T. So So dash I stands for interactive, dash T stands for TTY. So you, you can use the long form as well. And yeah, you can do the same thing. So it's like a, a terminal. So when, when you run it with a dash TTY is you tell the the container that you are running within a terminal. So it might output different kind of stuff on the uh, on standard output. So this is this is the terminal that we attach it to and we can interact interact like like how you would a normal terminal. So this this is this can be useful if like you you need to run specific uh, applications that you don't want to have installed on your computer, or let's say you want a specific version of, of say, Node.js. Uh, and look at what, what text they have here. So if you run without a tag, 
it will by default run the latest, right? But there are also other tags. So let's say, uh, maybe we go to some something a while back. Yeah, let's say you need this specific version, uh, 16, 16.1. So it's going to fetch this image and run it locally. Maybe there's no such thing. So let's say your container is uh, exposes some ports that you want to interact with. Because all these containers run in an isolated environment, you won't be able to access these ports on your own machine and on any other machines. So you will need to tell Docker to expose these ports. So let's say, uh, we, we tell it to publish a port. And dash p tells it to publish this part. So we go back to what we ran earlier. We specify name, environment variable, and the container name. And we add in a dash p, or we can type the full one publish. Five, four, three, two, so this is the default part that is exposed by this image. If you're not sure, you can always go to the actual image and look for what ports they use. We will find it somewhere. So, so you see this container is listening on 0000, 0, 0, 0 port 5432. And this is within the container itself. Then what we are doing here, we are telling Docker to also uh, publish these ports on our local machine. So anything that tries to go to our local machine at 5432 will be redirected to the containers port 5432. So uh, if, if you have another container or another, let's say you have a, a node application that needs to talk to a, a Postgres database, then you can just direct it to port 5432 on localhost. And you'll be able to talk to this database that is within a Docker container. And that's the only way you can talk to anything inside the container. So let's say, uh, install this. Okay, I think I'm not gonna go, go ahead with this. So you can, you can have multiple containers that that are on the same uh, container port, but they map to different host ports. So for example, I also run a MySQL and a MariaDB, which both expose on port 3306, but I'm directing them to my host machine on 3306 and 3307 respectively. So normally, if you try to uh, run two services on the same port, they, they are not going to work. But in this case, because it's a Docker container, they can do whatever they want within their own environment. Uh, we can try this, this thing, and we can actually see how it will work. So if you run this command, 
uh, it's going to run and remove afterwards and run detach in a detached mode and expose port 8000 of this container. You can take a look at what this container does. It's, it's just a to-do app that lets you uh, play around with Docker. So, so I already have the container, the image on my machine, but I run it in detached mode. And if you do a Docker PS afterwards, you can see that this thing is running and it's exposing on pod 8000. So you can go to localhost 8000 on your browser and you should be able to uh, yeah, come to this page and, and interact with it. So this is all, all running within the Docker container if you a look at the network calls. This is calling at to your eight thousand, and this eight thousand is is uh, running within the Docker container. So you can do a Docker logs like like what we mentioned earlier. This is the container ID. So you see, uh, yeah, we do a Docker logs follow, and we'll be able to see in real time all the logs that come in. See, we get a post and so on. So because Docker containers are ephemeral, so when we remove the container, all the data is lost. So we have all this information here, right? That we uh, ideally don't want to lose when we when we stop our containers. So if you stop the container, it's fine. Uh, you notice you can no longer access this page, and then you restart it. Oh yeah, because I, I ran it with a uh, dash dash rm. If I stop it, it's gonna remove itself. So when I run it, see all these items are gone. See, so I docker stop. It's a new instance. Everything, everything here will be gone when I refresh. So what we can do is. Uh, we keep all the stateless information within the containers, but we also separate out the, the state that we want to persist into our own file system. So we can mount the volumes to persist the file system. So this will be the command that we will need to use. Uh, so you do a dash dash volume to, to bind a specific volume. And this is what we're going to bind. We're going to bind this directory in slash temp slash to do on our own host direct host machine. You can put whatever you want here uh, into this specific folder within this container. So uh, I got this here. So if you take a look at uh, the documentation of this container, you can see that this is the actual path that they want you to mount it to. And that's, that's where I, we are going to get it from. Uh, personally, because my, my Docker daemon is running on root and the machine, the, the Docker container uh, is running with its own user, I wasn't able to, to run it without specifying the user. So we can, we can, let me show you what I mean. So this is the, the same command that we ran earlier with a uh, added name. And we are mounting this volume. So 
I'm gonna run it on a cache so we can see the output. So in this case, we cannot open this file because uh, This, this folder is owned by root. So we can tell Docker to run this as root as, as well. Image, let me run it again. See, we still at the dash dash rm, right? So this container will be removed when it's stopped, but anything persisted within this, this directory will still be kept, right? So this is running, uh, we do a logs to make sure that it works. It works. So this should be persisted when we stop this container. So it's no longer there. Uh, then we run it again. We refresh, it's, it's not working, right? And we run it with the same command, and we are still mounting this same directory. If you take a look at uh, this, this directory on your host system, you can actually see that there are files being populated. And yeah, this is being, this is, is now persisted, and, it's, and anything, anything you do here will be stored in your own host file system. So, this is an example of a volume being mounted on your own file system. But let's say you deploy on, on AWS, you can uh, use the volumes there instead of your own, your own machine that the Docker container is running on. So you can have this uh, virtual machine just to run Docker containers and your storage is stored on a separate machine. Sorry, what's the volume? So a volume in uh, is a term in Docker, which is uh, I guess it's uh, something you mount, like a file system that, it, that will be persisted. So it's uh, what, what the Docker, what, what the uh, container runtime will do when you mount the volume is it will overlay this, this uh, folder onto the file system. So your, your, when it try to, tries to access a path, right? It will try to look through its overlays first. And for example, you're saying that anything here will be found uh, here instead. Then instead of trying to go straight to the Docker image to get that anything there, it will go to this volume first. So you can mount multiple volumes. Let's say you have different folders that you want to mount or different files that you want to mount, a configuration file, uh, some kind of cache, you can all mount it, mount it on. And maybe you don't need, to be, don't need it to be so persistent uh, yeah, but you just don't want it to be inside the container, then you can just mount it as a volume as well. You can run the volume, you can mount the volumes as read only. So for example, you have a configuration file uh, for some for some applications that you want to have shared on a network file storage that then you can just mount it as a volume as read only. Yeah, so we, we did this earlier. We added a environment variable. You can see how this changes. So if you look at the documentation, they support different themes and you, you can just pass the environment variable in. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna try are you? Mm. Yeah. So uh, that depends on your application. So if if your API is stateless and you only interact with a database, right? All your persistence is done on the database side. You don't actually need any persistence on on your app API on your backend. But uh, some other shared uh, information can be shared on like maybe Redis. So your actual application can be stateless. And because it's stateless and it's in, in a container, right? 
you can scale it up very easily. You just launch multiple containers and they all talk to the same database, to the same Redis server. Yep. In, in most cases, you want your containers to be as stateless as possible because you want it to be a, like you can just run this again and everything else will be, will be the same, right? Yeah. So we, we run, uh, we can remove this. You see the color should change when I refresh. So this, uh, this container is being passed in this environment variable and is reading it and doing other things to it. So we can do the logs. Uh, if you want to get more information on like why your doc container is not running or why you cannot connect to it, you can do a Docker inspect. So you see, you can view the status of it, whether it's running or, or it exited, boom queue. So when your container tries to use too much memory that uh, you, you set a limit to, you, it'll be queued. Boom queue means out of memory. The image that is running which is, uh, yeah, this is the image hash, image digest, and it also stores information on, on the actual image that you're running. Then you can see the environment variables that you pass it to. These, are, these other environment variables are declared within the, the Docker image itself. So we, we didn't declare it, but it exists in the container. The command that you use to run it, uh, in this case, I think there's no. This is the command that we specify, which we didn't. A lot of information here that you, you should be able to troubleshoot most things with this. Yeah. So you can see it's binding this part to, to here. Uh, so you You can see we bind this directory here. Okay. Uh, we can try building our own containers. So uh, most of the time you can, depending on your users, you, you can use containers that already exist. Or if you are deploying your own application, you, you definitely have to build your own image, right? So, yeah, for example, if, if you have, if the existing containers don't match your requirements, so maybe you need a specific plugin for, for some, some application that you want bundled together with the image, but uh, nothing exists. So you can create, create that. Or you want to deploy your own application. So uh, you need, in order to create your own Docker image, you need to, Think of uh, how you want to build this working environment from scratch, and basically just write the recipe for it in in like the Docker file syntax. Similar to how you get it running on your own machine, right? Let's say you you will start from this operating system that you're using. Maybe you only support Ubuntu because uh, you don't want to have instructions for all the other distributions. Uh, what kind of dependencies you want to install, like uh, Node.js? And what other services it depends on. So let's say you, you also require a MongoDB or, or a Redis server, then you can also specify that in the Docker file. Uh, when, when I mean you can specify what services it depends, you can specify what, uh, what you will talk to. So this is an example of a Docker file. So 
Mm. We paste this into a Docker file. Let me save it. Uh, we can run it first, then we can go through what this does. So each, each command here creates a layer, and then uh, the following commands will add on to this layer. So our first layer will be this Ubuntu image. So this is the one that we put just now, right? This will be the base for it. So you're not going to use additional uh, this space, right, to store this, because this is from a, an existing image on your machine. Then you run uh, some updating commands. App get install. I think you need to add a, a dash y here, maybe. Just uh, expecting some interaction here, but there's no interaction. Then you set the work directory that this container will be working from when you launch it. So when you when you try to launch your container later. It will, this will be the directory that you will be running in. Then this copy dot dot is, you copy everything from your source directory, which is on your host machine, into the container inside slash app, right? Because this is the work directory that we are on. So if let's say you have a, a node project here, uh, it will be copied into, into this directory. Then you can run your npm run start. So this is the command. This is the default command that will be run if you don't specify any commands. It might take a while to update the app. So sometimes it, it makes more sense to uh, choose the right base image. So in this case, we, we don't want to install uh, this ourselves. So we specify that we, we just want to take the Node.js image. I'm going to finish the one earlier. We, we can just replace all of this into from node. Say we use, we use uh, node 16, which we decided just now. You can run the same command. So you see, I already have node 16 on my machine. So it's just going to put the hash here and skip the step. Then set the work directory. Uh, yeah, then it will set a hash again. Copy, set another hash. In this case, uh, you'll copy everything in this directory, except if I do a, I think it's a Docker ignore. This is like your git ignore. Let's say I don't want to put my Docker file inside. Uh, in most cases, it makes sense to put a Docker file. Maybe I want to put something else. What do I have? Maybe I have this uh, Postgres dump that I don't want to store inside. Or maybe uh, like a .git as well. And if I run a Docker build now, you see uh, at, at this point, it's not going to copy in those files that I specify in the Docker ignore. Then, yes, yeah, so you just state the commands then. We can run this. Uh, so there's no project here, so I, I don't think this container will run properly, but we can try. So this is the, the image name, right? The tag that I specified. So you see there's no package.json. That's because yeah, there's nothing inside. So if you list the Docker images on your machine, this is everything that you have put so far. And you see, this is something that we built. And then you can see there's a none. These guys are, uh, this this is the container that I built earlier. Then I attacked another, another image as Docker Workshop, right? So this one loses its tag. 
uh, and now it's just floating on my file system doing nothing and I can only access it using this this hash. So you can look at the history, the layers that we filled. So things start here. So these are all layers from the Ubuntu machine, uh, from the Node Node machine. So up until here, right? So because I use from Node, it's gonna use the Node image, which already has their own layers within, right? And you see these these layers are all missing on my machine because I didn't I didn't have to build them. I only fetched the outermost layer, which is this Node layer and everything else inside is, is just like overlaid on each other then these are the other layers that I added on afterwards so yeah, there are other other commands like uh, and let's say you want to do a okay. mm. yeah let's say you want to Specify a certain environment variable. A volume that you that you want to specify to tell them to mount or pods. Try to run the build again. Sorry, it's an ex post. So it's So this will, will specify that you want to uh, mount this volume and, and expose this part. So this, uh, for volume, what it does is when, when a container is run, it will copy out all the files within this directory into a, a, a new volume. And uh, for export, uh, for expose, it will just tell uh, it will just say that, oh, I want to expose this pod, and it's up to you to decide whether you want to expose it or not. So, yeah, so this can be an example Docker file for, for a node project that you want to deploy. You, you just need to specify the environment variables, mount the volumes that you need. Let's say you have some images that you want to mount uh, not within the container. Expose the pod that it runs on, then then specify the command that you should run when the container starts. Yeah, then when you do a Docker run, yeah, I can do a, I have a package that is on, and if I docker build, uh, so there's no start script here. There's a I say that if I run start, I'm just going to echo hello world. Then I will rebuild this. If you don't want to keep overwriting your images, you can add a version. So let's say I do a, like a 0, 1.0. Oh, sorry, I have to build it, right? I specify the, the tag 1.0. So it's going to build it and tag it as 1.0. 
Yep. I'm, I'm asking this thing that uh, uh, when trying to build the Docker file, mm -hmm. uh, internal load build definition from Docker file failed to solve the front end Docker, solve, Docker file, failed to read Docker file error from sender, mm -hmm. when trash operation. <laughs> Because this is running in the home directory, so it's trying to uh, put some other stuff in your in this Docker file. And I think it's in the container that like, it's going to try to, so you see there's a copy from the, yeah. it's going to try to copy everything in your home directory into the container. How about you make a, a save the directory? It's just hard. So you see now I have this image tagged as 1.0 and also another one tagged as latest. So I, I didn't override this image that I created. And we can try to run it. Yeah, because we we have this whole setting set up already, we will output hello world. And yeah, if you have your own project here, you can just substitute it in. Okay. Uh, so, if if you have noticed, right, up until now, we've just been running uh, commands. Uh, run at least like a really really long command with like a lot of a lot of command line flags, right? That we we might forget. So, one solution to it is. Uh, yeah, we have to specify all the mounts and ports uh, networking between containers. If you want to deploy more than one container, you have to specify all the environment variables and and like how are you going to like uh, put all these commands into a version control so that you know what's the actual command to run and, and you have it stored in, in your Git repository. So one solution is to put all this configuration into a YAML file. Uh, if if you if you took a look at this ProLogic uh, document, you can see something like this here already. So instead of running the Docker run, then you specify the ports and the volumes. This is all specified within the Docker Compose. Uh, yeah. So Docker Compose is just one way of specifying all your deployment uh, configuration, and. Uh, yeah, you, because it's all stored in a file, right? You can check that into a Git repository. Then, uh, for example, right, this is a voting app. So, if if you uh, look at this Docker samples voting app. This is the architecture. So you're going to have uh, five containers all running different different uh, like programs, right? So your voting app is using Python. Then this is a front end that is deployed for the users to vote. 
then it's going to talk to Redis and send and communicate to a worker that is written in .NET. Then the worker will uh, fill in the stuff into the database and the results app will let you see the results of the voting. And this is all written using different, uh, different languages, different frameworks, and uh, they just talk to each other doing, using specified protocols. And if you want to have this deployed onto your machine, just using Docker commands, right? This is something like what you would have to do. You have to run them all in uh, detached modes, uh, specify the names, then expose the pods for those that you need to expose, link the containers if they need to interact with each other. So for example, this voting app needs to talk to the Redis server. Then you need to link uh, this results app to the database, link the worker to the database and the Redis. And Oh, this guy's not there. Uh, yeah, with a Docker Compose file, you can just write something like this. Then uh, you just run a Docker Compose app or Docker Swarm, which uh, which comes with Docker, but it, it just supports the Docker Compose syntax. There's supposed to be a uh, something here. It's okay. Where were we? Yeah. So this is something that uh, just replicates what we've done earlier. So instead of linking the containers one by one, Docker Compose will create a network and link all the services in it within the network. So these guys will all will be running within the same network and they can talk to each other by, let's say the, the voting app can talk to the Redis server by just trying to call uh, the Redis, Redis host name, then the, the internal DNS will redirect it to this container. So we have this, let's try a... So if, if you don't have Docker Compose, then you can install it or we can do it this way. So we do a Docker Swarm init. So this means that you want to initialize your host machine as, as a Docker Swarm. So Docker Swarm lets you run multiple machines inside this same Swarm and, and you can deploy your jobs to each other. So in this case, I'm already uh, uh, yeah, in a Swarm. Then you can use a Docker stack. You deploy this is this will be the name of your service and this is the docker compose file that you want to use sorry uh, so a swarm is it's like a, you can think of it like a cluster so when you initialize the swarm you are going to be the only machine in the swarm but you can add more add more machines to the swarm so let's say i do a docker swarm div you recreate this swarm again so you see i'm the only some on the node that is participating as a manager, but I'll just leave and I'll create a new song. So you see, uh, I am now this swarm is not this node is now a manager, so this machine. And in order to add other workers to the swarm, I can just run this. And if if the networking is set up correctly, they can just join the swarm using this token. Then, uh, when I when I deploy a service later, this uh, the Docker Swarm will decide which machines to put these containers on. So you can deploy this service using this Docker Compose file.
So it first creates a network called uh, voting app default. So this is the service name and the default network. I can also specify like uh, the network here or uh, other information about these containers. Uh, then you create all these services. And if you're a Docker, Uh, so you see you have this stack, right, which contains all of these five services. And you can see these are the services they are running and they are all replicated. So if, if let's say you want to have uh, multiple replicas of this machine, like I said earlier, you have a stateless backend, you can just run multiple replicas right, by just stating replicas here. Then it will... Uh, yeah, run multiple copies of it. So in, in practice, what you'll do is you will do a, uh, you will add this Docker Compose into your, into your Git repository. So not sure if this works. I think it's at port five oh one. So you can do the same thing like Docker service logs. Let's see. I, I want to see the voting app, which is at port five thousand. Maybe I didn't set this up currently. So when you when you think you're done with it, you can just uh you can just remove your stack. Then Sorry. So these these are the containers that will be running on your machine when you when you run it. I think some of it might have shut down already. So let's say if I start the I try to deploy this again, right? To create all these services. You see it's starting up all this, slowly starting up the containers. So now everything is up. Then when I do a Docker, see these five replicas are up and then I can just remove this stack and everything will go down together. Okay. Yeah, that's an example of how you would deploy stuff using Docker Compose. So we can talk about orchestration. So the Docker Swarm is an example of a, a container orchestration tool. So what they do is they manage and scale containerized applications across multiple machines. Let's say you add more machines to this Swarm, you can uh, abstract out the concept of, of individual machines. So you just think of how many, how much CPU do you have to allocate? How much memory do you have to allocate? Then you can just launch all these applications and the uh, container orchestration tool, like Docker Swarm in this case, you will decide which machine to put this on. Uh, yeah, and because uh, your containers have everything specified within, right? 
they're, they run in an isolated environment, they just need the host kernel to run. Uh, they pretty much work everywhere as long as it's on Linux or, yeah. And then you can automatically scale applications up with your orchestration tool. So for example, you can uh, make sure that if, if this containers reach above a certain CPU limit, then you want to scale more, run more con applications up so that you don't you don't have uh, downtime for your users. Automatically restart your containers. So let's say your server stops running, uh, it terminates or it crashes, you can automatically replace them. Uh, you can perform rolling updates. So let's say you have five instances running, you don't want to have downtime when you update. You can update one first, then once it's running, then you slowly update the rest. And in this case, you can have zero downtime. So uh, the most widely used in the industry is Kubernetes. Uh, it's a lot more complicated. It comes with a lot more things than Docker Swarm. So you can abstract out a lot, a lot more concepts. Then you have Docker Swarm, which we used earlier. Uh, Nomad, another tool. Uh, so for example, when you, you when you might not want to use Kubernetes is uh, when when you don't have so much requirements. So for example, the kubelet, uh, which is like the, the daemon running for Kubernetes, I think it takes up like one gig or, or 500 max of RAM on idle. So uh, if, if your program doesn't even take up that much RAM, maybe you don't want to use that. So you use a manifest YAMLs similar to a Docker Compose, but uh, they also specify things like uh, what nodes to run it on, what ports, what uh, health checks you want to do. Then, uh, because it's complicated, right? Uh, yeah, most most companies use tools such as Helm to manage these YAMLs. So you think about it, you are using a tool to manage the YAML, to manage your containers, right? And you use the containers to abstract out this concept of resource as well. But these tools help you uh, make sure that your your configurations are, are deterministically set and then you can roll, roll back your deployment changes if let's say you have a, an error in the deployment. Uh, then you can also offer, you can also find like these managed services on, on Google GKE or Amazon uh, EKS. So in this case, you don't have to manage the Kubernetes uh, cluster yourself but you have to pay more, yeah. So this is Docker Swarm. It's a lot lighter than uh, Kubernetes. This is Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, then you can use the Docker Compose files that you have written just now. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, right, your Docker image consists of a registry, then a image, uh, then a namespace and image, then a tag. So you can also use private registries and GitLab provides a free container registry. So let's say I, I do a... So if you go under uh, this in GitLab, there is this container registry. You can see that uh, you can log in here, then you can build your image tag as registry.gitlab.com. And then you can push to this registry. And yeah, this is a private registry that uh, only people who have access to it can can use. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So if if you log in correctly, you should be able to uh, to get 
selected and pull this image and push your images. Uh, I can show you an example of how we use. Uh, I think it's a state on. Okay, I'll go in, into it later. Uh, we can also use Docker for development. So let's say your your project requires a database that needs to be set up, and you don't want to install it on your machine, right? Uh, yeah, you can just run this Postgres container, mount a volume to it if you want to persist the data. Then, yeah, restore a database dump if, if you want. So let's say you want to onboard a new backend developer. You just need to give them this command to launch your Docker container. And then maybe provide them a dump that is not included in your Git repository to get the database up to, like, we populate with some data that uh, might be helpful to help them get started. So, yeah, we create this container, set the user and password. Then we can ex exec some commands. So let's say we exec So we run uh, Postgres, the CLI tool, with the user database and the database Postgres. Then we can run something like this. We create a table. Uh, see, we have a Bobby table. Then we. your values here. So you insert into this table your values. So you insert some values. If you have some data in your database, then you can dump it up into a, a dump that you can let your coworkers import later. So you run a PG dump, then you output into this Postgres dump. See, it's just a tar archive that you can use to import later. So. You notice I didn't mount anything to this. I didn't, I didn't mount the volume here, right? So let's say you stop Postgres, remove Postgres, and then you try to deploy it again. And then if we execute it, if, if we uh, try to go into it again, uh, we have we no longer have any tables. This this. All these things is an empty database, right? And we can restore it here. So it's gonna uh, pipe this file into this this PG restore. And now, if you go back into this uh, database, see we have this Bobby table and we have all data back. So all you need to do is either either pass this command to another developer and this Postgres dump, or you pass a Docker Compose file with with this like command. Yeah, then you can just run your uh, your application like this. You just specify your database to be DB password, and then you expose your pod, right? So you can just connect to it directly on your machine. Uh, you can also mock an API. So let's say you use S3 in your in your application. Minio is an example of a S3 compatible block storage solution. So you can store like images, files on Minio instead of having to connect to S3. So if you don't want to uh, create a S3 environment for your development, you can just use this to deploy instead. So let's say I. I save this into a mini file. The 
Let's set a version. Mm, yeah, so I have to create a volume in this case to store my data. Uh, I didn't cover this, but I think you can read more about it if you want. Oh, I also have to specify uh, the volume here. Uh, I'm going to go through that now. But yeah, this is something you, you can do. So you just send your AWS endpoint to this, this container instead. Then you don't have to connect to AWS. Don't have to specify your, don't have to get a, a key from AWS. So maybe if you want to do testing, you can use this instead of the S3. You can save on some bandwidth costs. You can also uh, like create a Docker Compose file for your front-end developers to set up a backend if they want on their own machine. So uh, yeah, this is an example. You you just specify everything you need to run your API and, and maybe some other stuff. Then all your, your front-end developers need to do or anyone who wants to deploy a version of this on their own machine can just run it. Then all this, this is how you embed an environment variable into your Docker Compose files. So let's say you you have a .env file with like database URL and some other stuff. Then you just need to source it. Source the file, then you can do a Docker Compose yeah, and, and all this will be interpolated with your environment variables. Uh, there's another thing that I haven't tried yet, but I know you can use Visual Studio Code to work on code within the containers. So for example, you have a container uh, running a VS Code server, then all your VS Code on your on your own local machine is doing is uh, rendering the UI and talking to this VS Code server and and you can interact with code inside the container directly. So let's say you don't want to set up uh, like a Python environment for your this machine learning pro pro project. You can just uh, put it inside a container, have everything running, then uh, code, with it, code within the project from the outside, like using this VS Code on your own machine. Yeah, so you, you just need to install this extension and you can try to work with it. So uh, this is the most common use case, the, using it for deployment. And uh, yeah, so when you want to decide whether you should deploy using Docker, you should consider other container orchestration tools instead first. So like uh, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, or Nomad. Uh, if you just want to de deploy one container, maybe you can use some managed service instead of of uh, of running a virtual machine and and deploying and running Docker yourself. So another time you might not want to use Docker is if you have a very stateful pro program, like let's say databases. So if you run a database, you need to manage the backups itself. You need to make sure that you have uh, replicated databases so that you, you don't lose availability. You need to manage the security yourself. And it's a lot of work. So, uh, and, and Docker is also not very good with stateful things like a database. So you can use Docker for databases, but uh, you can also consider using managed databases like uh, uh, AWS RDS. And if, if you need to interact with specific hardware interfaces or you have some very specific uh, thing tailored to your machine that you that you want to run, then maybe you you can get away with like mounting these devices, but sometimes it's easier to just deploy on hard metal. <laughs> So when you want to deploy using Docker, you can use a reverse proxy to redirect your requests. So you see, 
uh, my containers are running, let's say they're running on specific ports within the containers, then you can have a reverse proxy on the outside that just tells, tells you how to access this. So what it does is, for example, you, you go to uh, a, a domain, let's say I go to so this is my this is my domain right and this anything here this is a wildcard that catches and anything here will go to my reverse proxy that will uh tell it what container to talk to or what port to talk to so when i go here this this uh the reverse proxy will proxy all the requests that i make to this container and let's say you have multiple uh, services that you want to expose to the internet. This is something that you can do. And there are a lot of services that, uh, a lot of like applications that help you automatically re uh, renew your SSL certs. So like if you use Nginx, you can have all these things and, and they'll even uh, automatically uh, deploy your, your uh, change your configuration as your deployments change. So Start going to this machine. So I have this container running. This is this is a nomad configuration file. It's similar to a Docker Compose. But what you what you need to see is that I am uh, running using this 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 configuration and this configuration is dynamically generated uh, based on what containers I have running. So it's just going to look through all the containers I have running and create the, the routes for it. Uh, you can also use GitLab CI. I, I, I'm quite sure GitHub Actions can do this as well. And and like if you use Jenkins or whatever, they also work. Uh, let me go back here. So for example, if you just specify a GitLab CI file, this is an example. Uh, we can read, read more about it on, on yeah. GitLab documentations. Basically, you uh, you can run all these things on specific commits. So let's say if uh, if your if my commit has a tag, or if is if the if it's merging into master, or if it's commit if it's a commit into master, then I will run this script, and it will log into the registry with all these variables. Then you'll pull the image that I have, build build my image and then eventually push it to my registry with the uh, information. Yeah, so every time we make a commit to master, this, this build process will run and it will create an image inside this container registry. So if you run your containers, uh, if you run your databases within a container, then you you also want to make sure you back them up properly, and there are containers that help you do them. So I think these guys they just help you uh, run a cron job to to manage these backups and maintain, uh, make sure you only keep certain amount of backups and everything. Then if you want to monitor your uh, Docker containers, you can use. So uh, there's this C advisor that collects and exports data about running containers. Then like, uh, like the resource usage over time, network statistics. Then you can use something like Prometheus to pull them and use Grafana to visualize. So these are uh, common tools that people use to monitor Docker. Okay, uh, that's all.
if if you guys have any questions or have any trouble catching up, can can ask me now. Sorry, this ones. You can get the slides here. Uh, you can get the slides at this URL. I have a question. Yeah. So suppose that I want to make a node project, right? Then all my dependencies and all are already contained inside the package of JSON. So why should I use Docker then? Like, what benefit do I get? So let's say you, you want to deploy this onto a machine that has other node projects running. You don't want to interfere with, with the node, right? So let's say your project uses node uh, version 16, or there's another legacy project that uses node v10. Then you can use the node version manager, but let's say you have different projects with all different languages, different tools that you need to manage all of them individually, right? Versus if you just have a container, you can package this up into a container. And, and just deploy it. So it, it also makes a lot more sense if, if you don't just think about one of your applications. So you're not just, you don't just have a node application, right? You also have a database, you also have, have uh, other services that you need to talk to. And if you all, if you deploy all of them using just Docker, it's, it's just one thing that you need to think about when you wanna uh, yeah, do your deployments. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Okay, I think that's it then. Thanks for coming, guys. Okay. Sorry, I got a question. Yeah. Um, realistically, like, what are, what's the performance overhead of using Docker? Uh, it's, it's almost negligible. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think the main overhead is, the, is that you need to store all this additional stuff on your file system, right? Yeah, that's all. It's like it's, it's, it's in the order of a few percent. Actually, right, the volume thing doesn't it go against the principle of like isolating containers if you're exposing the data to on the main file system. Yeah, but uh, in the ideal everything will be stateless, but that's that's not the case for most applications. But uh, you can that's why people also suggest you run your Docker containers with specific user users, so you only provide permissions to this this volume to this user, right? So it's, it's pretty hard for them to do anything. How does Docker solve the problem of like, since the initial, like at the first few slides you showed that if you have multiple mm -hmm. uh, virtual machines, then it's very bulky and repeated yep. use of resources. So how does Docker solve that exactly? So, if you take a look, right, when we do a Docker, this is the container that we built earlier. See, uh, we have all these layers that we have, that we built ourselves, right? Uh, but everything else from from here onwards, this these are all from the node container, and these layers can be reused, right? So let's say I have another container running running this uh, that is based off this same image. Then all of this will be duplicated. Then I won't need to store any additional information, right? Because all these are just overlays adding on to this layer. So I only need to store the additional layers that I have for every additional one. So if, if this node container is based off the Ubuntu container, then you have even more duplicates, right? You, you only need to store the node layer and If 
that's it then. Yeah, thanks so much everyone for coming down. Thanks so much for your workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.